Hosting the Author Studio, the Edina Arts Center is a jewel in leafy Roslyn Park in the city of Edina. It showcases the Peggy Kelly Media Art Studios, the Margaret Foss Gallery, and the Clark Gift Shop. We have a full-service media transfer department where our staff is close enough to keep your projects simple. Our gallery offers many shows throughout the year, including our annual Members Jury Show in the fall. The center serves over 5,000 students and guests each year and offers classes in painting, drawing, jewelry, photography, writing, and many more. Our pottery department features 15 different kilns and we're known as the biggest little pottery department in Minnesota. At the Edina Arts Center, we live up to our slogan of, Every day, I need art. Now sit back and enjoy this episode of The Author Studio, hosted by Colin Nelson. Well, good morning and welcome to the Author Studio. I'm Colin Nelson, the host of the uh, program. We'll talk to our guest in just a minute here, but I'd like to encourage you, after the show is over, to take a walk around this fascinating <coughs> building. You do not need to be a member or a, or need any resident to take classes here, workshops, to participate in any of the programs, or become a member. So I would encourage you particularly to look at the gift shop, which is to your right. There's also a media studio to your left that's uh, very interesting and actually is underutilized. So if any of you need that kind of help, it's available. In addition, uh, for those of you that may not know this, the Edina Film Festival is going on right now. Tonight is the final night at the Edina Theater. I'd encourage you to consider going all proceeds from the film festival come back here to support the Edina Arts Center. So we'd welcome you to do that. Um, we'll go from 10 to 11 today. If you need uh, lavatories, there's one behind you or one around to your left. We have run this program for about two years now and the purpose of the author studio is, in, is to introduce local writers uh, in all types of genres. We've had children's books, art books, fiction, nonfiction. We even had a poet who studied with Allen Ginsberg. That was quite the conversation. <laughs> anyway, today our guest is Lori Herzl, who is the um, editor and book reviewer at the Star Tribune. I'm sure you're all aware of who she is and familiar with her. You may not be aware, she's written an excellent memoir called News to Me, The Adventures of an Accidental Journalist. So we're going to talk about this in just a minute. Thank you. For those of you that are new to the um, uh, program, I'm passing around a uh, sign-up sheet. If you'd give us your name and your email, we will keep in touch with you for future programs and future authors. Thank you. So, Lori, um, you originally were born in Louisville, right? Right. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I read, oh, maybe six months to a year ago, uh, an article in the newspaper about you going back to Louisville to, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know, we could say find your roots, so to speak. Uh -huh. And I thought th that was so similar to what I thought you did in this book. Was it kind of an effort to, to go back, so to speak, when you wrote the book? Um, the, the book is a memoir of growing up in Duluth and my early years in journalism. I worked at the Duluth News Tribune from the time I was um, 19 <coughs> until I moved down here in 1994. So I was there for almost 20 years. And um, a memoir is really, it's an interesting genre. You go by memory, um, but you also have to do research. So yes, when I wrote the piece for the Star Tribune about going back to Louisville, 
I didn't remember Louisville. I moved away when I was two and a half. They, they pronounce that Louisville. I know they do, but <laughs> I have lived up here long enough that I don't pronounce it that way, and I feel silly. Scandinavians say, say it, Louisville. Right? Yes, Louisville. Um, so I was two and a half when my parents moved to Duluth, and my husband and I went back um, in, in the spring just to visit because I, you know, it was where I was from. I didn't remember it. I had heard all these stories, had lots of pictures, and I went back thinking that I would feel this great connection and what the story was about, the story mm -hmm. that you read in the paper, was I went back and I, I felt nothing. I, I didn't remember anything. <laughs> nothing right. resonated. Um, we went back to my, the house of my, where I was born and, you know, yeah, it looked just like the picture, but there was no emotional mm -hmm. resonance. Writing this, there was a lot of emotion because, of course, I do remember living in Duluth. I lived there, and like I said, until 1994. So writing this book, I, I went back up to Duluth um, several times to do research, to interview people that I had worked with, to go to the library and read through old copies of the, of the News Tribune from you know, when I first started working there, um, and just kind of walking around and, and getting a sense of place. I had not been back to visit the News Tribune building until after the book came out. The, um, this was sort of interesting. The, the editor had changed, so there was an editor there who didn't know me, and I had written to him and asked if I could come back to the paper and go through the files and look at the old photos and try to get a sense of you know what had been going on at the time and maybe use some of the old photos for the book. And he said no. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it turned out, I mean, it was very strange because he never told me why. And later I found out that um, my timing was really bad. There had been another local writer who had gone through their files and stolen a bunch of things. And so he was just saying no to everybody. But I, I'm like, I've worked there for 20 years. I'm writing a book <laughs> about the paper. But actually, in some ways, it was better that I didn't go back to the building until after the book was published because it had been remodeled so much that it didn't look the same. Mm -hmm. And I, it might have interfered with my memories of you know where things were and what things looked like at the time. You told me the, uh, the, the writing of the book itself was accidental. Yes. What do you mean? Um, pretty much everything I've ever done in my life has been an accident. <laughs> I've, I've never been one of those people that said, OK, by the time I'm 20, by the time I'm 40. Um, I have been working at the Star Tribune for about 17 years. And before I started at the Strib, I was a writer. I was a writer in Duluth at the paper. I was a writer at Minnesota Monthly <coughs> Magazine. I've written short stories that have been published. I've written articles for newspapers and magazines all over the country. And when I started at the Strib, I was as an editor. And about, oh gosh, eight or nine years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, it occurred to me that even though I think of myself as a writer, I've been doing nothing but editing for a long time. And so I started writing a blog. It's called Three Dog Blog. It's just, um, it was just a way to make myself write every day. I've never been somebody who could keep a journal. I think because I've been a journalist all my mm -hmm. life, I need to write for an audience. That's what you're trained to do. And so writing just for myself seemed kind of, um, unnecessary you know I already know what I think but you don't know what I think so I'm going to tell you what I think so I started writing this blog and it also blogs are wonderful because they have the uh, you know you can immediately publish so you get that satisfaction uh, you know of like immediately getting your stuff out there but you can also pull it back and fix mm -hmm. it <laughs> so it's it's kind of lovely so I started writing this blog and I was just telling stories about my morning walks with my dogs or you know, growing up in Duluth, and it was just, just a way to tell stories, just a way to make myself write. And um, at one point I started telling stories on the blog about my early years in journalism, and the people who read the blog said they really liked those stories and they wanted more. And I, I generally blogged Monday through Friday, so I had a series of five stories about uh, working at the paper in Duluth. And they, they I had more questions and they wanted more stories. So after a couple months I wrote five more, and then after a few more months, I wrote five more. So I had 15 little stories about working at the News Tribune and how I got started. And, and um, this is before I was the books editor at the Strib. I had this sort of part-time gig reviewing manuscripts for the University of Minnesota Press. They would give me a manuscript. I would critique it and tell them what I thought. They sometimes took my advice. They sometimes didn't. It was kind of interesting work. I don't do that anymore because it would not be appropriate in my job now. But at the time, I was 
projects editor at the Strib. So I knew the acquisitions editor. And we were having lunch one day, and I mentioned that I had written these 15 little stories about my life as a journalist. And he said, you know, he would be interested in seeing them. And I thought, aha, 15 stories, 15 chapters. 15 chapters. Yeah. Book is done, right? <laughs> so, yeah, everybody's laughing. Everybody in the room is smarter than I am. So, <laughs> I sent him the 15 little stories, and after a while, he, he wrote back and he said that he had his assistant print them out. He said it was 32 pages long. Where's the rest of your book? And I mean, it's because blog items are really pretty short. So, he and I had a series of conversations. Um, it took a year, really, to to decide to do a book. Um, and he said what I needed to do was have more of a storyline. I needed to develop myself as a character. I needed more about what was going on in Duluth at the time, what the big news stories were. You know, He just told me all this stuff that I had to do to these 15 little chapters. And it was just like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. But then I did. So it was, I had not really ever intended to write a book or a memoir. Um, but so I did it sort of by accident. One of the interesting things I found when I read the book was there were very few women, mm -hmm. well, in journalism, period, but particularly in Duluth, Minnesota. Right. right? How, how did that work? Well, <laughs> I started at the News Tribune in 1976. So, you know, women in the workplace was, women were just really starting to flood the workplace. There had been women working there before me. I was not, by any means, the first. There were women reporters before me. There was a city editor named Janet Burns who, when I started, had just moved back into reporting. She was an older woman, very tough. But, um, but the other women who had been reporters had left. I think they'd gotten married and moved on or gone on to bigger places. So there was Janet, and then um, there were, I think, two other women reporters, Jackie Bonashinsky, um, who's quite well known here. I think she won the Pulitzer Prize when she was a reporter at the Pioneer Press, and Suzanne Perry. And that was pretty much it. Um, everybody else was male. And there were no women photographers. There were no women sports writers. There were no women copy editors. There were no women in management. Mm -hmm. I was a clerk. I was not hired as a reporter. I was just, you know, one year out of college. I'd had one year of college. So I was just very shy, and I was just, you know, the gopher. And, um, and that year that I was hired, they started hiring more women, and we ended up hiring the first woman photographer <coughs> and the first woman sports writer. And, and so I really was there at the very beginning of this kind of massive change. And the other change was um, they started hiring a lot of younger people out of college. Mm -hmm. And so the room went from older male to younger and much more mixed. So I can picture something out of a film where there's a big bullpen and old guys with hair slicked back, right? <laughs> Typewriters, cigar smoke. There were. I don't remember anybody smoking cigars, but people smoked <laughs> cigarettes like mad. Oh yes, they they pretty much lived on coffee and cigarettes. Yeah, it's true. What are some of your uh, best and worst memories of that experience? Well, um, those of you who are women <laughs> could probably identify with the the what we would now call sexism. Um, in 1976, it really wasn't called anything. It was just sort of the way the world was. So the way that, you know, the way you had as a young woman, a young, very naive, very shy woman, I had to navigate this world of kind of hard-boiled guys. You know, you, you can't fall apart when they do things because, you know, you have to be tough enough to survive in a newsroom. On the other hand, you know, you can't let stuff slide necessarily because they're offensive in many ways. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have to be a good sport. I mean, it was, it was this very tricky path for a while. Mm -hmm. um, there's one incident that I write about in the book. I hadn't been there very long, and we still used typewriters, electric typewriters, and there were no computers yet. And um, I didn't have my own desk. I was just a clerk. So I just sat wherever there was an empty desk. And there was one desk in particular that had um, the cord was really short, or maybe the outlet was kind of far away, but it kept, if you touched the cord, it would unplug, and I'd have to crawl into the desk and plug it back in. And so I'm typing away whatever obits or, you know, briefs, whatever <laughs> I was doing, I thought it was very important. And, you know, touched the cord, and unplugged, I crawled under the desk, plugged it back in, and when I started to come back out again, the city editor was standing there blocking my way. And he was this, um, 
kind of macho guy who wore tight jeans and smoked like mad and wore cowboy boots and rode a motorcycle. And he had his thumbs in the belt loops and was kind of staring down at me and his legs are kind of spread. And behind him is the copy desk, all men watching mm -hmm. what's going on. And I'm stuck under the desk, kind of, you know, and I can't get out because he's blocking my way. And he said, there's something about the sight of a woman on the floor. Mm. And the whole copy desk just burst out laughing. And, wow. and I was just, I, you know, and I didn't really know how to respond because people are always joking around in a newsroom, especially in a newsroom. There's a lot of dark humor because they deal with, you know, tragedy and, and bad news and you kind of have to laugh stuff off. On the other hand, it was really kind of intimidating. So um, that was probably maybe the worst thing. Yeah, <laughs> But things changed pretty quickly okay. after that. So, Have you got something you can read from uh, um, uh, your, your book? I would like to read a really short, short piece um, about when I was the clerk and I was supposed to make coffee for the newsroom. Um, <laughs> I didn't uh, like to do. <laughs> so this is very short. It won't take very long. Um, it was my first day on the job. The city editor, different city editor, much, much nicer guy. There were two newspapers at the time, the Morning News Tribune, and that's where the macho city editor was in charge, and the Afternoon Herald. And Fritz Nothacker was the editor of the Herald, and he was, he was a very nice guy. Fritz took me downstairs to the press room, where I saw huge thrumming machinery and men in leather aprons, plastic ear protectors, and small square hats folded out of newsprint. The presses ran most of the time, Fritz explained, because when they weren't printing the two daily papers, they were printing the Sunday inserts and advance sections. Then he took me back up to the newsroom and I learned my duties. Answering phones, writing obituaries, compiling the marine log, walking across the street and collecting matters of record from the courthouse. All that sounded great. What did not sound great was this, making coffee. The room lived on coffee. The men drank it by the gallon all day and into the night, and it was up to me to make sure that the big urn in the corner never ran dry. I might have been timid, but I had a strong sense of fairness. I didn't drink coffee, so I saw no good reason why making it should be my responsibility. Also, it was logistically complicated. The only place with a sink deep enough to hold the coffee urn was the men's restroom. <laughs> there was a women's restroom on our floor, but it was a tiny one-hole affair with a shallow sink located directly across from the sports department. That meant that every time one of the seven women on the floor had to pee, the sports writers didn't just know it, they could hear it. It was a humiliating bathroom for a shy person, and it was of absolutely no use in making coffee. To make coffee, I had to lug the urn down the hall to the men's room, pound on the door, yell, is anybody in there? and then go in and fill it up at the big deep sink, hoping that no guy came in needing to take a whiz, and then stagger back with it down the hall, water sloshing my ankles. This was not something I was inclined to do. So I set about scheming to get out of this responsibility. First I started bugging guys when they were at their busiest. Can you fill the coffee pot for me? There's someone in the bathroom. They didn't care to be interrupted when they were on deadline, and they didn't want to be away from their phones when they were waiting for a call back from a source. So this drove them a little nuts. And then I made coffee badly, undrinkably <laughs> so. And in a newsroom, that's saying a lot. <laughs> Guys sauntered over to the coffee pot, filled their blackened cups, took a deep swig, and then coughed and choked. Maybe they even spat it out on the linoleum floor. Gah! Who made this? And someone would give a nod in my direction. I was over at the city desk answering the phone and typing obituaries and throwing wadded up press releases into the trash without looking, you know, trying to appear swamped and important, just like Fritz. And I said, isn't it any good? Sorry, I don't drink coffee. I don't know how it's supposed to taste. So it wasn't too long before that responsibility just sort of evaporated and I could concentrate on the fun stuff snooping around the county courthouse among the bankruptcies, marriage license applications, and divorces, calling the fire chief to get the fire runs. Food on stove was a common one, as was dryer fire, which almost certainly launched my lifelong paranoia about leaving the dryer going when I'm not home, and writing short newsy items for our daily Duluth briefs roundup. When the Herald came up off the press in the early afternoon and was delivered to each desk by Nancy the copy girl, I opened it up, 
turned to the Duluth briefs and stared at them with love. I wrote that. I wrote that. I read them over and over. <laughs> I got no byline, no tagline. Most of them were written straight off of news releases and required no human contact whatsoever. But even so, there was something magical about seeing words that I had written, put into print, and distributed for all the world to read. So oh, you can nice. see I was not a very good clerk. <laughs> no, that was very nice. We, we get a lot of uh, requests in our writing classes here mm -hmm. at the um, Arts Center for memoir. Sure. Writing. Mm -hmm. um, 25 words or less, how do you write a memoir? I can't do it in 25 words or <laughs> okay. less. Do you really know? Is anybody going to count my words? Um, <coughs> memoir is a really tricky genre because there's nobody watching to make sure that you're telling the truth and people tend to lie, exaggerate. Um, I did not because I'm a journalist. Mm. I don't think that you should. I think that memoir should be as true as you can make it. Memoir is based on your memories but it can't come entirely from your memories because your memories are faulty. Um, so. It's, it's interesting because I think ever since Angela's Ashes, have you guys, most of you read Angela's mm -hmm. Ashes, it has become the norm for, for memoir to read like fiction. It reads like a novel. It has great characters and it has funny scenes and it has dialogue and it has all of this stuff that a novel has, but it is all expected to be true. And that's a really high bar. There's not a lot of dialogue in this book because I didn't really take notes on my whole life. Um, and the dialogue that's in here, I either remember very well or I took from letters or mm -hmm. news stories, or as I interviewed people from my life, we agreed on <coughs> what the conversation was. I I, nothing is made up. Um, <coughs> so you have to figure out the story you want to tell. A memoir generally is not your entire autobiography. This is just the story of my life as a journalist in Duluth. That's, that's the parameter for this book. Um, you have to interview people that you were with. You have to go back and do some research mm -hmm. so that you know that you're getting the facts right. And then you have to tell an engaging story. Um, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's the trickiest genre. Well, I've had a number of people talk to me about writing memoirs and they'll tell me, well, but, but my life is so boring. Uh -huh. what, what, what would I write about? What, uh -huh. what do you recommend? Like you picked a particular... Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of humor in there, there's, mm -hmm. there's some drama, some of the stories you covered, your trips to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for people who want to write a memoir but feel they've not had an exciting, adventurous life? Nobody has a boring life. Nobody has a boring life. You could not persuade me of that. Everybody has a fascinating life. There's a novel, it's not memoir, but novel mm -hmm. that came out this fall by Alice McDermott called Someone, which is a novel of a very ordinary woman, nothing fantastic happens to her and it's a riveting book because of the details. It's a great book and I, I went to hear Alice McDermott speak when she was in town. Mm -hmm. she's, she won the National Book Award some years ago and she's just a very accomplished novelist and she felt very strongly that people on the, on the surface, people have ordinary lives but once you start digging deep to the details of what happens to them, nothing is ordinary and nothing is boring. So I would say each one of you could write a memoir because you all have something in your life that, that eats away at you or mm -hmm. that you can't forget or that you want to preserve. Um, I started writing this partly because of you know, the whole thing with the, the editor at the U of M Press, but the reason I started writing the little pieces on the blog was because there's so much about journalism that's changing so fast that a lot of our old traditions are getting forgotten. Um, you know, just some of our jargon, why, why the copy desk has rimmers and slaughters, you know, and, <laughs> and how things worked back in the day when we designed pages on paper using, you know, cropping wheels instead mm. of, you know, just punching things into a computer. And I wanted people to remember that history. And um, I don't, I'm not an historian and I'm not a journalist, uh, and I'm not an historian of journalism, but through telling my story and what happened to me, I could get some of that down on paper and preserve it. So. I think that if you're going to write a memoir or if you're interested, you have to think um, what is the story you want to tell and who do you want to tell it to? You know, I wrote this mainly for a regional audience and I thought journalists, in particular young journalists, would be mm -hmm. interested in this because of the history. A lot of people write their memoirs for their family. Mm -hmm. You know, just um, I, I teach memoir workshops. I taught one in Duluth last weekend 
And my old editor from the Duluth News Tribune took my class, which was kind of funny. <laughs> and he said that he wanted to write a history of his family to give to his grandchildren. So, you know, if you think in terms of who might read it and who might be interested in it, I think that will help you shape your story. You touched on something that I'm sure you've been asked before. Mm -hmm. uh, the future of particularly print uh, journalism. I know mm -hmm. as an author we always talk about print books versus e-books uh -huh. versus whatever is going to come around the uh -huh. corner next week. Right. But let's look at journalism. It's, it's obviously changing. From your mm -hmm. perspective in journalism, how do, you, how do you see the future? Well, I do get asked that question a lot and, you know, the short answer is, I don't know. But, I mean, I probably, okay. I have we'll some, move on. <laughs> I'm sure I have some insights. I mean, it's funny because when I was working at the Duluth paper, there were two papers. There was a morning paper and there was an afternoon paper. And reporters often had to write the same story twice. You know, they'd write it quick for the afternoon paper and then they'd have more time to do more reporting and do a much more full job and a more responsible job for the next morning's paper. Mm -hmm. And then the papers merged and there was only one paper. And all the reporters were like, oh, thank God, I don't have to write the same story twice anymore. Well, now you have to write the same story like 11 times because there's the internet. And so you write the story fast and get it online. And then you do some more reporting and you update it online. And you, you know, and you kept, so it's like things have gotten even um, wow. more complicated. I didn't realize that. Well, I was story in today's paper um, about an author, Catherine Powers, whose father, J.F. Powers, was a very notable mm -hmm. Minnesota writer. Catherine Powers lives in Massachusetts. And... She put out a collection of her father's letters, which was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux this fall. It's been reviewed everywhere, the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. We reviewed it because J.F. Powers was such a famous Minnesota writer. He won the National Book Award mm -hmm. in 1963. And um, she can't get the book in her own library in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They turned her down. They said it's not on the New York Times bestseller list. They don't want it. So it was an interesting story. So I wrote it as a blog post because I try to do a blog post um, at least two or three times a week, um, book, books coverage, not my personal blog. And the editor liked it, and I had to do, and do a story, which meant, you know, then you go back and you do more reporting and you get more information and you write it in you know, a little different tone and then it goes in the paper. So with the internet, you know, yes, there's always that feeling of you need to update, you need to rewrite, you need to get the f freshest news out there. But does that mean that print will go away? Um, to be quite honest, print is where the advertising is. And if we don't have advertisers, we don't have any revenue. And if we don't have any revenue, we don't have a staff. So um, right now, print is not going away. Mm -hmm. It's um, the places that have tried that, going internet only, are not succeeding. Those papers are folding. Um, I think the one in Ann Arbor, which went internet only several years ago, no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't any money there. And news gathering is expensive. You know, we have a big newsroom. Our newsroom has gotten a lot smaller in the last maybe seven years or so. But, you know, we still have several hundred people in the newsroom, and we do like to get paid. So, what, Do you have any thoughts about so many, so many aspects of media have gone to infomercials, which they call news. The Star Tribune doesn't do that. But no. <laughs> No, we try not to blur the lines. Yeah, what um, thoughts uh, about that? Are, are those media that are going to infomercials are, and call it news, are, yeah. are they making money? Are they going to I don't know survive? if they're making money. Um, infomercials is, is fake news. It's news with an agenda. Right. It's news to sell something. Um, so don't trust it. What you want is news that is as objective as you can get it, and that's still the mainstream media, despite what... Um, some people might say. So, uh, you know, th that is a problem with the internet. You know, you can get news or news anywhere, you know. Anybody can um, it. But I always am suspicious of news that comes from websites with an agenda. When somebody posts something from Democratic Underground or Tea Party News, either way, it's going to be slanted. <clears throat> and you're not going to get the full story and you're not going to understand what's really going on. And those things are designed to get you riled up. Whereas I think if you, you know, if someone posts something from the Washington Post or, you know, the Star Tribune, then you can at least trust that it's as objective as the reporter could make it. And it should have all sides covered. It shouldn't have an agenda. So I would just say beware of news with an agenda because you don't have, you don't get mm -hmm. the full picture. Mm -hmm.
But are they making money? Uh, probably. Yeah. But money isn't everything. Integrity. Let's, let's talk about your job. I would suspect that everyone in this room is a reader. So I hope so. I imagine, Lori, when you go to work on yes. a cold winter day, you sit in your office and sun is coming through the window, you're in a comfortable chair, dog is next to you in a pot of tea, and you get to read <laughs> eight, nine hours a day, right? Oh, my God. A, I don't have an office. <laughs> B, you I don't, don't have two dogs, though. That they don't go to work with okay. me. Sorry. Um, yes, I'm the books editor, and... And it is amazing to me the number of people who think that my job means that I get to read all day. And actually, I don't mean to mock them because I used to think that's what the job was too, that's which is why I wanted the job. Um, <laughs> turns out that's not how it works. My job is to do any book news that goes into the paper. Um, I, I um, edit and curate the two books pages that run on Sundays. We have two full pages of reviews and columns and that sort of thing. We also do reviews Wednesdays and Mondays. So I pick all of those books, edit all those reviews, write some of them myself. I also write a books column. that's just sort of a roundup of <coughs> who's publishing what and who's won awards and just kind of the newsy stuff about local and regional authors. Um, if we do author profiles, <coughs> I usually do them. I, I don't do them all because it's just not physically possible, but I write a lot of the author profiles. Um, I do Q and A's with authors coming to town. I attend a lot of, of events and we blog about it. I've started um, the blog is well read, but it's not nearly as well read as print, obviously. So, I've been taking the blog items. Like I went to see um, uh, Louise Erdrich in conversation with Jhumpa Lahiri, for example, and I wrote a blog item about that. And then I took the blog item and reworked it for print and put it on the books page so that if you missed that event, you get a flavor of what it was like. So all of that is, is my job. Um, I get about 1,000 books a month in the mail from publishers. And my job is to go through the books and decide which ones we're going to review. And um, like I said, it's, it's maybe 10 books a week. So out of 1,000 books a month, a lot of them simply don't ever see the light of day, which is very sad and it's frustrating because so many of them are more than worthy and I wish there was some way of getting the word out on even more books than we can but I you know I have the space that I have so I spend a lot of time going through the books reading parts of them maybe the first couple of pages to get a flavor of them um, and then deciding which ones will review and who will review them I have a stable of maybe 50 critics. I haven't never really counted, but maybe 50 that I rely on um, mostly. Some are local, some are not, and I think it's important to have that mix because I like to have sort of a regional sense of the pages. We're not the New York Times. I don't want to copy the New York Times. I'm interested in local book critics and what they have to say. But on the other hand, we have a lot of local writers here and they can't be reviewing each other. It's a small community. They know each other. I do not allow my critics to review books of people they know. So I have to have reviewers who live mm -hmm. elsewhere, mm -hmm. which is especially important with poetry because I swear every poet knows every other poet here. And I, you know, I, for a while I used a poetry critic in Duluth and then he started coming to the cities and meeting people and I had to fire him. So, How did, um, how did you start in, the, in this job? In this job? Well, um, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is I was the projects editor, the books editor quit, and the editor of the paper asked me if I would take the job. The longer answer is I've always been a reader. My father was a university professor, an English professor. My mother was a librarian. Um, when I worked at the Duluth paper, I took on the sort of, it was just like an extra job. It wasn't a job. It was just something I did, which was curating the reviews that we ran mm -hmm. in the Duluth paper, and I wrote a little books column for them just because I thought it was something the papers should do and no one had done before. It was just extra work. And then when I moved to Minnesota Monthly, again, I, um, I just sort of made it part of my job to interview authors and write about books and look at books that were coming out and, and sometimes excerpt them in the magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's always been an interest of mine. And um, the books editor job, has turned over two or three times since I've been at the Strib, and I did apply for it once and didn't get it, um, which is a theme of this book, but I never got anything the first time I tried, um, never. Um, so I just kind of forgot about it, and then when Sally Williams left, I was, I was the projects editor at the Strib. It was a, a, a great job, 
but I was, I'd been in it for like five years and it's a very high pressure job. So when the editor took me out to lunch and said, would you be interested in being books editor? It was uh, a delightful surprise. There you go. And it's already been five years, but I'm not oh. burned out yet. <laughs> what do you like best about it, Lori? Oh, geez. I, you know, there are a lot of things I like about it. I like the self-sufficiency. Um, I've had two different supervisors since I've been in this job, and we're now on our second uh, top editor. No one tells me what to do. I really like that. Um, no one comes to me and says, you have to review this book, or my best friend wrote a book, will you, you know? Mm -hmm. I have autonomy, and I like that. I work best when, <coughs> when no one's telling me what to do. If you tell me what to do, then I get kind of cranky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I had a novel, and you, I, know you ha. I, look, I know you like dogs. <laughs> I do. Well, you've got two dogs, right? So if I wanted to get reviewed, if I sent you the novel in a box with a couple of puppies, uh -huh. would that do it? <laughs> you would be surprised how people have tried to bribe me. <laughs> I am so not. Tell I am, me a I couple am of those. not bribable. Tell us a couple of I those I am stories. absolutely not bribable. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, I could tell you. Uh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> There was one guy, I don't remember who he was. We don't review self-published books. That may change at some point because that is such a growing field. But at this point, I'm already getting 1,000 books a month from commercial publishers who have curated and you know, decided these are the best books. These are the ones that deserve to be published. There's so many self-published books, I can't look at them all. And they're usually not widely available except on the internet. And so at this point, I don't review self-published books. It's hard to tell a self-published author that because people put a lot of time into their book, mm -hmm. they put a lot of money into publishing them, they get frustrated because then no one knows about their book and they want me to put it in the paper. Um, so I had one guy who didn't live in Minnesota, he was a self-published author, and he sent me his book in a box along with a box of C's chocolates. And it was mailed from the C's candy store somewhere in California. And it didn't have his name on it or his return address or anything. It was just this box with a book and a box of chocolates. Well, I don't accept gifts. So there was no way to return it. So I gave it to the copy desk. I thought that would be a safe thing to do, and they ate it. And I didn't even have one. I had none because I don't, you can't bribe me. So I was, you know, at my desk working away, and a couple weeks went by, and my phone rang, and I answered the phone, and this guy on the other end didn't say hello, didn't say, he just said, did you like the chocolates? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to think, Ooh, you know. And then I had another guy. Be um, a mystery story there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mystery briefly, and then it was like, oh. um, if if I get a gift in the mail like that that I can't return and it's not edible, we have a gift room that we it all goes in the gift room and then the stuff gets sent to the. Um, loaves and fishes yeah. or, you know, the homeless shelter or whatever. So don't even bother. Just give your <laughs> gift directly to them and bypass me. I, I did have another guy who self-published um, a children's book, and he was absolutely determined that I was going to review his book. And I felt bad because I was brand new in the job, and I didn't know enough to just say, no, absolutely not. I, I kind of strung him along thinking I was being nice, and I know better now. Um, so he kept calling me and, and wanting to know when his book was going to be published. And I kept saying, well, you know, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's going to make the cut. But because I was sort of nice about it, he mm -hmm. held on to hope. And finally, he sent me a registered letter so that I had to read it. <laughs> and in the registered letter, he wanted to know if he sent me two pounds of wild rice, if that would change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Then I had to like stop him because I didn't want him to send me two pounds of wild rice. So no, don't send me a puppy. Well, of the thousand books you get, you get can you tell us what criteria do you, what, how do you pick the ones you do review? What are the things you look for? Or I said, yes. I know there's a balance between yes. fiction, nonfiction, and so on, but yes. what criteria do you use? Well, I'll just have to say it's an art, not a science. Um, I go by so many things and I make my decisions at this by now I can make them pretty quickly um, I look for all of these things but but even if a book has all of these things it doesn't mean I will review it there's no automatic anything so I look for big books 
you know, that everyone's going to be talking about, Jonathan Franzen, Stephen King, you know, Donna Tartt's first book in 12 years, I can't mm -hmm. pass those up because those are talkers. People care about those books. Um, it doesn't mean I review every single big book because otherwise that's all I would do. I look for local writers. Again, there's so many, I can't do them all. I wish I could, I can't. I look for um, authors coming to town. My books page tomorrow, I think, I'm always working several weeks in advance, so it's hard to remember exactly what's running tomorrow. I think every review is tied to an event because there's so many authors that come through town. So I can't do every author that comes to town, there's no room. But again, author coming to town, local writer, big book. I also, um, I really like reviewing books from small presses and university presses. There are a lot of really wonderful, creative, small independent presses that don't get much attention because where are they going to get mm -hmm. noticed? Saraband books. Presses. Yeah, Saraband out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. See, I said it right that time. Um, they do beautiful stuff, poetry and fiction and essays. They're very small. A lot of people haven't heard of them. Um, there's one called um, Two Dollar Radio out of Chicago and Small Beer Press, which has nothing to do with beer. Um, I like looking at engine books, does really cool stuff. And we, we have a review running tomorrow of an engine books novel by a guy named Snowden Wright. I think it's his first novel. And he wrote a novel about the life of blues musician Robert Johnson. Do you guys know Robert Johnson who mm -hmm. died at age 29? Very mysterious man, very little known about him. So Snowden Wright kind of took the guy's life and fictionalized it. And it's a really interesting book called Play Pretty Blues. Tiny little publisher no one's ever heard of. He's coming to town. He'll be at Macabre's Books next week. Seemed like a perfect one to review. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our lead reviews tomorrow. Um, so I'm looking for all of these things. I, I do. I like to mix up um, genre, so we have fiction, nonfiction, poetry, memoir, um, we do mysteries, we do popular fiction, we do young adult books, but you know, you can't mix everything up every time because again, space is like my big enemy. So I think over time you get a lot of variety, maybe on one given Sunday it might be all fiction because that's kind of how the publishing world goes, a lot of fiction published in September. A lot of nonfiction in November, a lot mm -hmm. of fiction in April. You know, they have their own rhythm that I have to kind of go by. But um, my hope is when you pick up the Sunday paper and look at the books pages, there will be at least one book that you're interested in and maybe one book that will surprise you that you'd never heard of before. That's really mm -hmm. my goal. Well, I think a lot of people don't r uh, realize that many, many newspapers in the country no longer have any book section. It's true. It's true. Yeah, a lot most, of newspapers. Most don't. Yeah, my job is like uh, it's gone from many many papers, or it's been folded into the arts coverage, yeah. and so they just run a couple reviews here and there. The Star Tribune has been wonderful about um, preserving my space and even allowing me to expand it. When I took the job, um, we ran up two full pages on Sunday as we do now, and then a wire review on Wednesdays. I don't run any wire reviews. I commission every single review we run. So the Wednesday reviews, which you sort of have to look for, they're buried in the mm -hmm. variety section. They're worth reading, they're not filler. Those are books that I have looked at and said, this deserves a review and I've gone out and found a reviewer and paid for a review. So search for those reviews. And now we also do two reviews on Monday that are staff written. So I, I cram books news in as often as no, I can. That's wonderful. Because <laughs> I, we, I we feel, all appreciate well, it. I think it's important <coughs> and especially in, you know, there are so many writers and readers here and so many bookstores. This is just a, you know, how could we ever get rid of books coverage? But, yes. but other newspapers have, it's true. Well, it's a very, Twin Cities, very literate area yes. compared to other cities. It's true. Size. Um, you come from a family of journalists. You mentioned your father was a professor. Mm -hmm. Your mother was a librarian. Mm -hmm. and you worked as a librarian for a while, didn't you? I did. I, well, <laughs> I worked at the public library. This again is in, in this book and it, it's actually kind of a funny story. When I was in high school, um, when I was 13 or 14, I got a part-time job shelving books at the public library in Duluth. They paid me 75 cents an hour, which was way below minimum wage. In those years it was $1.20, but for some reason, because it was the city, they got to pay you less. So it took a long time to save up any money. It's like my check every two weeks, I think, was $28. Oh my God, how will I spend this? Um, <laughs> it was so boring. I just hated it. And I love libraries, but it was the most boring job. 
you know, you'd go to work and there'd be all these books and you'd load up a cart and you'd put them in alphabetical order or by Dewey Decimal, bring the cart out, put them on the shelves, yeah. go back. It was, it was two hours never went so slowly. And if there weren't any books to shelve, then the job got even worse because then you just had to pick a shelf and stand there and make sure all the books were in order. <laughs> It was called reading shelves, and I would just about die. So I went to the, the newspaper from there. Um, suddenly Thank I was goodness. making $120 a week. It was like, whoa. And um, was the clerk making coffee briefly and then doing all those other things. And then eventually moved into the library, which was a promotion. And then I found out, oh my god, I forgot how boring this is. <laughs> So I worked as the librarian for several years before I went back out into the newsroom and yeah. became a copy editor. So many journalist friends of mine are, would love to be full-time writers. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way? You mean leave the paper? And, right. You know, we all dream of retiring, but I think once you retire, it's hard because, you know, the, especially a newspaper, it's such a, it's such a busy place and... And there's a certain kind of person in a newsroom. There, you know, there's there's um, hardworking, funny, you know, kind of a dark sense of humor. I like the people I work with. And even though any Monday morning, I would tell you, I would much rather stay home. I like being there. I like being in a newsroom. Um, when I went to Minnesota Monthly Magazine, that was a great job because writing magazine pieces and editing a magazine was was the same but different and I learned a lot and I learned how to do long form writing and um, I learned how to work with freelancers all of this was useful mm -hmm. later on but it's a different kind of person mm -hmm. at a magazine you know you have to dress better I mean <laughs> this is this is high fashion for me look how shiny my shoes are um, you know it, it's casual and and hard working and fun so I'm not ready to retire, but mm -hmm. um, I do wish I had more time to write. This is true. Um, I'm, I'm doing something kind of ridiculous. I have just enrolled in an MFA program, so I'm going to work on my MFA while I'm working at the paper, which means that at the end of two years when I'm done studying, I should have another book right. ready to go. Right. Um, this is if I don't kill myself in the process, because yeah. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do all of that, but <laughs> we'll see. Questions for Lori? Bill? You said advertising was keeping the print papers going. Yes. Does advertising influence anything that you choose, or do advertisers choose because they know what you're doing? Advertisers don't know what I'm doing, and the books pages are supposed to be devoid of ads. We have had ads on them lately because um, we're not in a position to turn down ads. We're not that wealthy. And there have, been, um, there have been some businesses that have requested their ads on the books pages. So, you know, that's like, oh, good, I'm popular. Oh, bad, they're taking my space away. But, mm -hmm. um, but no, they don't know what I'm doing. And, uh, um, and there, there is a wall between advertising and the newsroom. I, I don't even know the people that work in advertising. No one, no one tells me what to do. <laughs> Michael, did you have a question? I remember you saying once, Larry, that um, for the book reviews, you don't do negative reviews. Not exactly right. Not, okay. e not well, exactly right. Then. Okay. We do not trash first novels. I see no reason to pick up a book by a writer that's never had anything published before, no one's ever heard of, and trash it in print and say, you've never heard of Lori Herzl. Her book is terrible. Don't buy it. Um, that just seems silly to me. Like, why devote the space to that, and why destroy somebody who's just starting out? If it's not their first book, it's fair game. Um, I do prefer, you're right in that I prefer the pages, because I have limited space for review, I prefer the, the reviews to be recommendations. Here's 12 books that you might want to read. That doesn't mean that they're all like chirpy, happy reviews. There's plenty of reviews where the book didn't measure up. Um, the ending didn't make sense, the characters were flat, but it's still worth reading. So, but I have, you know, if it's a big name, I think um, John Irving's last book, my critic trashed that pretty heavily. So I, I, I prefer not to run reviews where, if the book is so bad that the review is going to be just scathing, 
I'm not sure it's worth the space unless the writer is well known, and then it's a warning to you: don't get John Irving's next yeah. book. You know, mm -hmm. um, but if it's some unknown person, I'm you'd have to persuade me that it was worthwhile to spend the space on it. You must feel pretty competent then in all these different genres. I realize that maybe in historical fiction you mm -hmm. might send that out to some other reviewer, but you yourself must have a very good knowledge of all these different genres because you're the gatekeeper at the front end, right? I'm the gatekeeper and it's been, I mean, I have had to learn. I've had mm -hmm. to learn who all these writers are. I mean, I've, I've always been a reader all my life, but there's plenty of writers that I'd not heard of and um, you know, I have, I, like I said, I have a stable of reviewers, some of who have been reviewing for the paper much longer than my time. And they're trustworthy, they know what they're doing, they've been reviewing books for years, they're members of the National Book Critics Circle, um, and if one of them says so-and-so is coming out with a book and I, I'm interested, and I've never heard of the writer, it's mm -hmm. like, thank you, because now I won't look stupid by f missing that book. So yeah, I've had to learn a lot. Um, when I write reviews, I primarily review nonfiction. I am most comfortable in nonfiction. I know good nonfiction. I review memoir. I review um, other nonfiction. I reviewed um, Going Clear, which is now up for the National Book Award. It's Lawrence Wright's book about the Church of Scientology. What a fascinating book. So books of reportage like that I will review. I, I do little reviews of fiction, but I prefer to leave the fiction reviews to people who are um, more steeped in that world. I'm really more of a nonfiction person myself. Other questions here I saw. Uh, way in the back. Thomas? When you read, do you read e-books or do you read the physical book? That's a very good question. Mostly I read the physical book. If I'm re reading to review, I really need the physical book so that I can flip around in it more easily. I'm not very adept at e-readers and it may be that there's a way to flip back and forth really quickly. I've, I don't know how to do that. Um, I like post-it notes. I like underlining. I fold down pages. I, I need to be able to find the quote that I want really quickly. Um, if it's nonfiction, which is primarily what I review, an index is really helpful. So I'm just better at using this kind of a book. I'm not opposed to e-readers, but for reviewing, I find it more difficult. None of my critics use e-readers. There is something out there called um, net galleys because publishers, you know, when, when we review a book, a publisher will send a soft cover early version of a book about three months before the book is published. And that's so that we can read the book, think about it, write a review, edit the review, and put it on the page right around the time the book is in the bookstores. It's called PubDate. Um, so net galleys is a way for publishers to save money by sending the, the galleys out as an e-book rather than publishing these soft cover early editions. I do not have one critic who will use the net galleys mm. for the same reasons that I've given. They're hard to n navigate and they're hard to highlight. And um, As far as just reading a book for pleasure, um, I do have a Kindle. It's the very first generation, which I hope means it'll be worth millions someday. <laughs> the original Kindle. The battery keeps dying, and I keep forgetting where the patch cord is. I don't use it very often, but I have used it. Um, I've used it for books, kind of lighter books that I just kind of want to read for fun. Um, there's a great, great kind of light book called Where'd You Go, Bernadette, that came out last year by Maria Semple. It's a funny book. It's a great read. Um, I was sitting on the couch. I read reference to it on a Sunday evening. There was nowhere to go buy the book on a Sunday evening. And I downloaded it on my Kindle and I read it that night. So, Barbara, did you have a question? Um, well, as a photojournalist, I've had, you know, I started out about the same time you did. I uh -huh. think. Uh, so it's just been uh, uh, taking me back to, to memories. Um, I love the title of your book, uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering about um, does the title make a difference <coughs> in the, when you choose to review, and does the cover influence you when you uh, to choose? And my last question is, what do you do with a thousand books a month? <laughs> <laughs> the title, I mean, it's all a package. The title, the author, um, the book cover, 
do make a difference. They do, which is another reason why e-readers are tif difficult because those things go, well, well, the title and the author don't go away, but the book jacket kind of does. Um, book jackets are a fascinating, um, they're fascinating works of art because they really convey a lot and it's very deliberate. Even this part of the book is very, very deliberately designed. Um, and I notice these things now because I do have to look at books really quickly. Um, you can tell by the art if a book is serious or if it's lighter, more populist, or if it's you know a mystery or if it, I mean you really get a sense of the genre and the seriousness of a book. And that doesn't mean that I only want serious books because I don't, but I do want to know what I'm getting. Book blurbs make a difference to me, not what they say because they all say you know this book Great is book. You know, at the top of her power. You know they're all <laughs> silly, but who's blurbing it? You know if. If Elizabeth Gilbert blurbs a book, that tells me one thing. And if Elizabeth Berg blurbs a book, that tells me something else. And if, you know, well, A.J. Jacobs blurbs everything, so that doesn't tell me anything anymore. But, you know, I mean, who it is that's blurbing it is a clue as to what kind of book it is. So all of those things, they don't make a difference yes or no, but they make a difference as to my figuring out what kind of book it is even before I've opened the book. What do I do with 1,000 books a month? Um, like I said, I get these advanced copies three months in advance. Those we recycle because they're not finished books. They are not to be sold. They are not for general distribution. They are out there. I can't tell you how many arcs I have autographed of this, and I don't know where people are getting them. But the arc means advanced reader copy, and they're for bookstores to look at to see if they want to order the book for stock and books critics to use when they review books. Um, so those I keep until the finished book comes in, and then we recycle the, the arcs. The finished book, after the book review has come in, I use the finished book for editing the review to make sure that the, uh, the critic has quoted accurately and that other things are right, like the page numbers and price and things that might change. Sometimes the advanced copies don't have photos or indexes, and so I can add that information. Then I send the final copy to the critic as part of their pay. We also pay them money, which is nice. But we, they also get the finished book. The other finished books, the other 990 <laughs> books, I, they go under the table on the floor of my book room, <laughs> which you have seen, my book room. Yes. It's um, a little smaller than this room, and it's shelves all the way around, and that's where all the books are filed by month. Um, and the ones that aren't reviewing go under the table on the floor. Twice a year, we have a book sale for Star Tribune staff. The money goes to nonprofits and scholarship funds. We raise usually about two to three thousand uh dollars -huh. twice a year, so about six thousand dollars a year, and it all goes to nonprofits. And then whatever doesn't sell at the book sale, we box up and we donate to the Shakopee Women's Prison for their library and their outreach projects. And then by then, I will have several thousand more books that have come in. <laughs> so it's never ending. Unfortunately, we okay. One more question. <laughs> on, on Sundays, you usually publish a little section called Author Talks for the following week. Is there any way where you could put uh, a lot of those authors are people you have never heard of? Is there any way you can put like a one line clue as to what, whether it's fiction, non fiction, fly fiction, or whatever it might be about so people could decide what they're going to Is that, are you talking about the coming next Sunday coming part? Next Oh, the author talks. There is absolutely no room. There are so many authors that come through town that that calendar, we can only run a small part of it in print and the rest of it goes online. Because if we ran every author talk every week, it would take up half a page. And, and I can't do that. So there isn't room to add anything. I'm actually, I violate Star Tribune's style. Don't tell my boss, but you know, I take out the address of the bookstore, I take out the subtitles, I take everything out to fit in more events just so that I don't have to send you online. You know, I don't have room. If, if there were fewer authors coming to town or doing <laughs> talks, it'd be easy. But there's, there's five or six a day, you know, wow. it's amazing. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I want to mention one thing to uh, 
not only people here, but people who may be watching this on television, all of our programs are uploaded to YouTube. So if you were to go to YouTube, the Dinah Arts Center, the Author Studio, you could see some of our past programs. Or you can watch this one again and again. Yes. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Michael Fry, the director of the Arts Center, Lola and uh, Phil, who have done wonderful work with the technical. Thank you all for coming. In particular, Lori, thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming.